Hello. Eastern Europe is disappearing. Alvain, a quaint village 120 km south of Berlin, is like many villages in former East Germany. A previously vibrant little community supported by small local shops, a public transport system connecting into the rest of the country, as well as a coal mine where many in the community worked. Now it barely exists on the map, with an aging population of less than 20 people, a shut down mine, and no shops or buses nearby. This is one example of something that's happened to many other East German communities and beyond. Repuznica, a Serbian village on the border with Bulgaria, has been near entirely depopulated after state factories in the region closed, leaving empty bars, homes, and streets. Serbia is in fact becoming known for this, and this issue has now reached national proportions. Skomlia in Bulgaria, formerly a growing riverside community pre-1990, is now less than 20 people, with the youngest inhabitant being 61 years old. Others, like Kotomori in Moldova, were already declining when climate change sped up what began with market liberalization in the 90s. Why is this happening? We'll have to zoom out first. The economic and political reforms that followed during the transition from planned to market economies in Eastern Europe resulted in an unprecedented fall in output, a rapid impoverishment of large sections of society, increasing uncertainty about the future and an exceptional population crisis. Let me give you several examples. Between 1989 and 1994, marriage rates fell by nearly 50% in Georgia. Birth rates shrank by up to 40% in Estonia. Death rates amongst men due to cardiovascular and violent causes more than doubled in Russia. The natural increase of the population had become negative in Bulgaria, the Czech Republic, Hungary, Romania, the three Baltic countries, Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus. Suicide and homicide skyrocketed, coinciding with an equivalent fall in crude marriage rate. The net decline in crude birth rate was astonishing and started a domino process that still hasn't been recovered from to this day. Hilariously, the book Lessons from the Economic Transition clamors for a silver lining to these developments, and the best it can do is sum up demographic catastrophe as resource saving and pollution slash emission reducing. The paper, The Demographic Impact of Sudden Impoverishment, Eastern Europe during the 1989-1994 transition states it clearly. Demographic changes of the magnitude discussed have been observed only during famines or wars, though under such circumstances large mortality increases have been most commonly caused by infectious diseases and undernutrition, and the drop in fertility by biological rather than social factors. It also outlines the effect of psychosocial stress, which has been successfully tied to negative outcomes in mortality and fertility levels. In particular, they show that the most prevalent sources of stress in Eastern Europe are family instability and breakdown, job insecurity, unemployment, sudden impoverishment, high inflation, migration, and depression. Along with higher mortality, there's also a lower overall marriage and fertility rate, mostly due to increasingly difficult access to and greater costs of housing and related costs for heating, electricity, water, maintenance, and so on. After 1990, the economic catastrophe of Eastern Europe decimated the construction sector, which entirely halted maintenance work and greatly reduced the amount of new housing being built. To quote, between 1989 and 1994, the number of new housing units completed dropped by over 70% in Bulgaria, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, and Moldova, by 67% in the Czech Republic, and by 52% in Poland. Liberalization and privatization of the rental market meant housing for new couples basically became next to impossible. Many new couples had to pay open market prices for housing, with the example given that the market price for a two-room apartment of 50 square meters in Khabarovsk was $30,000 in 1994. The average annual wage in the oblast during the period was about 3% of this figure. Likewise with child rearing costs, the general increase of prices in children's necessities, milk, children's clothing, kindergartens, education and medical services, outpaced the price rise of most other already highly inflated commodities and services. This coincided with the complete gutting of subsidized services and goods for children, including daycare. To contrast, in pre-market policy Eastern Europe, support for child rearing was generally provided through child allowances designed to offset an important part of the cost of raising a child, and through the provision of highly subsidized childcare services meant to assist parents, particularly women, in the workforce in their task of raising children and fostering the socialization of children. These material factors played a much larger role than career or cultural attitude shifts. Likewise, poverty rates rose sharply in the 90s, particularly among the working age population and their children. For example, in Hungary in 1992, the incidence of poverty among households with two unemployed persons was close to 50%, while unemployment shot up throughout the entire region overall. Through a mixture of all the above, poverty, unemployment, migration, divorce, uncertainty, hopelessness, and so on, the conditions for increased violence, non-compliance with regulations, and illegal behavior, family conflicts, domestic violence, loss of self-esteem, and alcoholism are the examples given in the paper, were created. 
All these features are echoed by practically all the available research. To quote, the symptoms are closer to crisis behavior than to intentional choice. Consumer prices, low real wage growth, high unemployment, and a rather medium level of social protection have contributed to family income deterioration. The intensification of pathological occurrences, rising criminality, corruption, etc. led to an increased general feeling of insecurity and distress. In particular, the increasing shortage of housing has led to a deterioration of living conditions. Social costs are much higher than was expected. Funnily enough, their recommendations for suitable solutions quote unquote, to the problems of rising mortality and declining fertility rates in Eastern Europe are stronger support measures in health and more effective family transfers, but also much more aggressive policies to enhance tax collection, to support employment, minimum wages and social safety nets, and to control inflation. Basically all things that were non-issues prior to the market transition. Likewise, they state in the paper that the rise in external mortality, as large as those described in the paper, could not have taken place, particularly in the countries of the former Soviet Union, if a major collapse of the regulatory, inspection, and repressive apparatuses of the state had not occurred. Politically charged language aside, the rise of homicide, prostitution, drug abuse, extremes of poverty, and otherwise would not have taken place had rule of law in the form of pre-market transition states remained, along with the material base of that rule of law. A minor addendum is that the very first source basically deals with all the usual inadequate arguments when it comes to the causes or consequences of the demographic shift, for example cultural attitude changes, pollution, for mortality, etc. etc. Refer to that paper if you have any thoughts along those lines. Back to the video in just a second. Let's hear from today's sponsor, Atlas VPN. For a lot of research that I do for my videos, I end up hitting pages that aren't available in my location. That's frustrating, as you can imagine. Geo-restriction really does suck, but not with Atlas VPN. For those unaware, a virtual private network makes all of your internet traffic travel through an encrypted tunnel. This way, it protects you from spying, public Wi-Fi dangers, and hides your IP address and your online activities. It even allows you to change your location for all your researching needs. Developed by top cybersecurity specialists and IT engineers in 2019, Atlas VPN was created to make the internet accessible and secure for everybody. Currently, it has more than 6 million users worldwide and boasts the best VPN deal on the market with the most affordable online protection plan for just under $2 per month, if you can believe it, with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So, what are you waiting for? Go down to the description and click that link and use my code Hakeem to get a 3-year subscription for just $183 a month with 3 months free. But that's not all. You get blazing fast speeds for streaming or gaming, unlimited protection for all your devices, an inbuilt ad and malware blocker, and you'll get to save some extra cash as Atlas VPN will find you the best deals online from everything from your online subscriptions to airlines, hotels, and more. Right now, Atlas VPN is running a huge discount. It means you can get a three year subscription for just $183 a month with a 30 day money back guarantee. Time is running out, so get your deal by clicking the link in the video description below. Massive thanks to Atlas VPN for the sponsorship. This is what allows me to pay my editor fairly, so the support is highly appreciated. All right, back to the video. Immediately post-market liberalization, employment in nearly all sectors of every Eastern European economy crashed, and aside from a few sectors, 30 years afterwards, has never really recovered. In Southeast Europe, unemployment is more than twice as high for youth as for adults, at 48%, almost double that of Western Europe. Of those unemployed youth, a significant proportion are not in employment, education, or training, which in countries like Albania, where the workforce is almost entirely youth, is catastrophic. After market liberalization in 1990, labor force participation dropped in every single Eastern European country, with women retreating from the workforce as all previous aid in the form of childcare and otherwise was stripped away, with this retreat affecting everything from depression rates amongst women to marital satisfaction. See Goetze's work, Why Women Have Better Sex Under Socialism. In some countries, the decline in male labor participation was higher as a result of a contracting labor market. Don't lose this important bit of nuance. In many countries post-liberalization, there was a smaller total pool of labor to draw from, and yet massively higher employment, the typical rotten fruit of capitalism. Furthermore, long-term unemployment, over one year, in 1999, exceeded 40% in most countries, and similar patterns continue to this day, from Estonia to the Czech Republic. The common wisdom of with economic growth you'll get more employment is rendered invalid by the nature of new work within these economies, a factor noticed with the modest economic development since 1990, of which a good proportion of, and in many countries essentially all, has been nearly entirely undone by the 2008 recession and subsequent Covid pandemic. Essentially, with the return of markets and capitalism came the return of what Marx titled the Reserve Army of Labor, a massive group of unemployed youths to maintain lower wages, to fill up spots during strikes, and to maintain general labor pool abundance, keeping working class organizational power low, amongst other things. This is the fundamental explanation of why every single capitalist economy maintains a rather sizable unemployed sector, despite there always being plenty of work to do. 
A common objection is that, although noticeable unemployment remains in all Eastern European countries, it's better than it was in the 1990s. To that, all you need to say is, does a 7% unemployment rate today make nearly two decades of 20% unemployment and lost economic development okay? Let's discuss international migration and the sheer population loss of said nations. In the early 1990s, 10% of Albanians left Albania, half a million Romanians did the same. Yugoslavia, the former USSR, Poland, essentially the largest ever mass political defection of people. If I was being extra cheeky and using the usual charged language of propagandists. In reality, like most migrants, these people left for economic reasons. Let's quantify that in real terms though. Over the past 30 years, Romania has lost 14% of its population, Moldova 70%, Ukraine 18%, Bosnia 20%, Bulgaria and Lithuania 21%, Latvia 25%. And that's only official figures. Extrapolating to 2050, the estimated peacetime depopulation of Eastern Europe will be another 20% on top. Simply, the world's 10 fastest declining populations, minus Japan, are all located in Central and Eastern Europe. The reasons for this are unsurprising. Western work opportunities, income possibilities, institutional quality, for example research labs, universities, etc. all play a direct role in incentivizing this depopulation of Eastern Europe. The usual mechanisms are at fault for the reduced quality of everything within Eastern Europe, that being unequal exchange and value transference. In essence, the economic exploitation of the area, very much akin to the exploitation of Latin America, Africa and everywhere else by Western Europe and North America, maintains these formerly self-sufficient and developed economies as agricultural, labor and natural resource vassals. Tens of billions are drawn out in the form of labor, cheap resources, energy, etc. every single year by the core EU countries, speeding up this decline ever further. More clearly, Eastern Europe has likewise suffered a substantial brain drain as a result of this crisis, with a number of countries or groups of countries, for example the US, Australia, Canada, the European Union, etc. benefiting from significant import of human capital. In Hungary alone, since joining the EU in 2004, 5,000 doctors have left the country, with similar falls in other technical specialists from IT to engineering. Likewise, 580,000 highly skilled and educated Poles live in another EU member state in 2017. Likewise, with migrant labor, there are increasingly large groups of workers in search of jobs in Western Europe, of which Ukrainian, Romanian and Polish labor seem to be the predominant groups. Unsurprisingly, a net loss of labor and professionals essentially forces these countries into perpetual economic subservience to Western Europe. The political consequences of these changes are dire. There are already discussions of dual participation systems in Eastern European EU countries, where people can get work permits to sustain labor market needs, but can never become participants in the political system because they'd be barred from citizenship. The ridiculousness of a political system where a large proportion of workers can't vote and a large proportion of voters are retired isn't lost on those that discuss this possibility. Incentives for mothers to increase fertility only manage one side of the issue, while the fundamental economic and living standard reality in these countries goes mostly unchanged. Government subsidies and market systems can't outpace rising living costs and market-determined rent, stable prices, employment opportunities, amongst other requirements of life. Any increase in fertility without dealing with the core issues will simply result in more immigration down the line. Likewise, other ridiculous proposals include the usual late-stage capitalist nightmare of raising the retirement age, recommended by the IMF, in countries where life expectancy is already not that high to begin with. This doesn't even begin to deal with incredibly restrictive immigration laws in Eastern Europe, which in just a few decades will have massively aged populations with a small minority of youth to potentially look after them, either through taxed income towards pensions or through elderly care. The myth of economic convergence between Eastern and Western Europe is, well, a myth. IMF research taking into account the shrinking labor supply, the lower productivity of workers as they age, general aging trends in Eastern Europe, as well as the economic consequences of an aging population, have found that these countries will lose about 1% of GDP per year for the next 30 years, meaning in 2050, Eastern European GDP will only be 60% of Western European levels in 2050, compared with the 52% it is right now. In essence, this crawling pace is so slow as to render convergence an ideological dream rather than a political reality. The worst part of all of this is, every single official, advisor and economist of the era knew that this was going to happen after the market transition, yet encouraged market liberalization without any regard for the inevitable consequences. This is because ideology, not rational policy, dictated what was going to happen. The illegal and undemocratic dissolution of the USSR, along with the complete gutting of Eastern European economies and the destruction of their entire social setup, resulted in an Eastern Europe denied development or crippled in their development for over 30 years. An Eastern 
Europe that, even in the best of circumstances, would take decades to recover even pre-1990 levels, let alone achieve meaningful development not entirely directed towards propping up the imperialist economies of Western Europe and North America. Don't misunderstand, technology has marched on regardless and with that came some improvement in some sectors, and in a select few two or possibly three countries, meaningful improvements in quality of life as well. However, a strong argument can be made that, had the transition never occurred, nearly all these countries would have been better off, even by large margins. And that's all for this time. If you enjoy what I do, then please consider supporting me on Patreon, it really does help. I'd like to thank my patrons, so thank you to... Noms Chomsky, Sean Stevens, Vegan Marxist, Jeremy Miller, Yuriton, Proleyev, Tomasz Olszewski, Luz Vader, Nicolo Guadagnolo, Shivaru, Salian, D, Furry Comrade, Mantis himself, Francis Fish, Gregory Samsa, Chemtrails Just Lines of Coke for Jesus, oh my god, <laughs> Cthulhu on Ice, Dom, John Batakia, Ryan Brown, Box Cinnabon Badger, Prishtail, Will, Edwin Hermato, Venbog, Derek, Joseph Aboud, and Banana Man Ultimate. Thanks for watching.